words of power because we are kings and our words matter. God wants to use this kindness that he has shown us through the cross of Calvary to show forth his love to others. First of all, we need to understand it. We need to understand how much God loves us. We need to understand what kind of love with which God loves. It's extraordinary love with which God has loved us. That is what made us what we are. We have not made ourselves what we are. It is God's love. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, everyone overcome. We have overcome by the blood of the Lamb, and the word of our testimony, everyone. The two important things that could not ever meet have met on the cross of Calvary through Jesus Christ. Justice, that is, a, that is mercy, which is love, and truth, which is righteousness, have met. And righteousness, which is justice, and peace, which is love, have met together, have kissed each other on the cross of Calvary through Jesus Christ. So, how does that happen? See, what God did was, he knew that he cannot, he cannot apply his justice to us and at the same time mercy upon us, except in one way. That is, by bringing in a substitute. A substitute. Jesus is our substitute. He brings in Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God, second person of the Trinity. He brings in Jesus. He comes in the form of flesh. He comes into this world. He becomes the substitute for entire mankind. Now, this substitute is a very important substitute. None of us can be a substitute. None of us here can be a substitute. 
Even if it can be, I don't think anybody will volunteer to go to the cross and die. But thank God, none of us qualify. Even if one of us say, I want to go to the cross, I want to die, we don't want you to die because useless. When you die, you got to die for yourself because all men are sinners. They have to first die for themselves, to save themselves, to pay for their own sins, they have to die. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So none of us can die for any other man because we'll end up just dying for ourselves and going away. That's all can happen. So somebody new has to come. Someone of whom you can say that he has no sin, that man must come. Here it says all have sinned. But there is one that has never sinned. There is no sin in him. That is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. The second person of the Trinity. He had to come, take on human flesh, enter into this world. He had to become substitute because only such a substitute can take our place. Why that substitute is necessary? Because when the substitute comes, everything that must come to us by way of punishment can be put upon him. And he can die in our place as our substitute. He can take all that and everything that is a blessing of God can come to us. The love of God can be shown to us and that comes to us directly. So God made this wonderful arrangement. This is the cross of Calvary. He brought his son into the world. He became our substitute. He put him on the cross of Calvary. He became a sacrifice, a propitiation for us. And uh, God took all the sin of all humanity and laid it upon him. And he bore all our sins so that God can turn his face away from him and pour out his wrath upon him and punish him. He became cursed on the cross of Calvary so that God can turn around and administer his mercy and love on us. This is exactly what happened on the cross of Calvary and this is how the story of God, uh, the gospel unfolds. Now, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? A lot of people say, why the cross? He could have died of some kind of sickness. Why did he have to die on the cross? Well, he could not have died of some kind of sickness because remember in the Old Testament when they brought sacrifices, like the sin offering and various other offerings that, are, that you read about in the book of Leviticus and so on, when they brought the offerings, the animal that is brought as an offering for their sin should not be in any way sick or lame or blind or whatever, you know. There should not be any blemish. It should be without any blemish, spotless and blemish, and, and, and without any blemish. And uh, so you, uh, when, you, when you brought your offering back in those days uh, for your sin, you got to make sure that they have no blemish. No, they're spotless and without any blemish. So you would go to your sheep and you will run through them and pick out the best. You know, like if you took them to one of these competitions they have for dogs and cats and so on, you know, in Chennai. All these fluffy animals are taken there dressed up so nicely and put on competitions and one of them wins the first prize. The first prize one only qualifies. It has to be the best. That's, what, that's the way God says, you cannot bring anything that is less than the best. You got to bring the best. So you can't bring the sick, you can't bring all these blemishes and spot, spot, ones with spots and so on. So Christ, Jesus, is the best. He'll win every competition among men. He's the best of all men. He's sinless. He's the holy son of God, but in human form, in human flesh. He had flesh, bone, and blood body just like us. So he became the perfect sacrifice for us. You know, he had to die not just of some sickness, 
He had to die as a sacrifice. As a sacrifice means you are brought there and killed. That is why a death on the cross was necessary. He must be killed because he's a sacrifice. He must be sacrificed. You can't say he died of pneumonia or something like that. He's a sacrifice. He has to be brought and laid there at the altar and sacrificed. So Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. That is why a death on a cross was necessary, not just any death. Also, a public crucifixion was important. It has to be done that way. Now these days, if they hang a person, they'll, I think they just take them into a room and a few witnesses and they hang them, but not the whole crowd, you know, not in front of everybody. But the public crucifixion had a purpose. Why? Because the fact that God hated sin must be displayed. How much God hates sin, how much sin is wrong, and what will happen to a person when he sins, what sin does to a person must be displayed in public. It is for all to learn. Therefore, Jesus had to be crucified in public because he bore the sin of the world. This is how God punishes sin. This is how God deals with sin. God hates sin. God is furious about sin. God is against sin. God pours all his wrath upon sin. God does not approve of sin. The soul that sin shall die, that must be demonstrated. That is why the public death, but in the, in the Old Testament, when the people are getting ready to enter the promised land, God gave them a procedure that they need to follow when somebody is killed in that way, a criminal is killed that way. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 21, the last two verses. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he's put to death and you hang him on a tree. Notice the procedure, hanging him on a tree. Who is this person? He's deserving of death. That means he's committed a great crime and he must die. So, what do you do with him? His body shall not remain overnight on the tree. Notice this, when you kill him by hanging on the tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day. That means while it is yet day, you must bury him in daylight, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. What God is saying is, this guy is a criminal, done very bad things. He deserves death according to God's law. See, the nation of Israel had God's laws. So he deserved death. If he deserved death according to God's law, then he is accursed of God. God hates sin. What he did must have been so terrible. That's why he's hanging on a tree. When you hang such a person on a tree for a horrible, heinous crime, you should not leave him hanging there overnight because when you leave him hanging there overnight, because he's accursed of God, his curse might defile the promised land, the blessed land that God had given them, the land flowing with milk and honey. Don't leave him hang hanging there overnight, he says. Hang him there, but before sundown, bury him. They followed that. In Joshua's days, they captured five kings. You'll read about in Joshua chapter 10. Captured five kings. Come and reported to Joshua. Joshua says, wait, I'll finish the war and come. And he comes and they kill him, kill the five kings and kill them by hanging. And they hang on a tree. And uh, by sundown, Joshua says, take them down and bury them in that same cave where they were kept. And they're buried in that cave. And when Jesus died, notice this, when Jesus died on the cross, when the evening had come, their exact phrase is used in 27th chapter of Matthew, I think, verse 52, I think. When the evening had come, that's very important. That means before it became dark, before nighttime. When the evening had come, Joseph of Arimathea went and asked Pilate for the body and took the body and buried the body in a new grave. Why? Because Jesus hung there carrying the sin of the whole world, considered accursed of God. This is exactly what Paul refers to in Galatians 3, and we all know Galatians 3. A lot of us don't know Deuteronomy 21. But Galatians 3 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
As it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Where is it written? It's written in Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 and 23. As it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. So what happened on the cross is this. It was a public crucifixion. Why public crucifixion? Jesus was condemned before the whole world. God is showing to the whole world that God condemns sin. Sin is punishable by death. We deserve death. That we deserve nothing less than death. But that death is now, that death punishment is given to Jesus. He hung there because of our sin. The world must see that sin is bad. The world must see that God hates sin. The world must see that sin has its punishment. The world must see that Jesus has become a sacrifice for our sins. That's why the public crucifixion. And not only does, should the world see that God hates sin, let me tell you something, the world also must see that God loves you and me so much that he will allow his son to die with such shame because of his love for us. This aspect you must never forget. God is not just trying to display the horror of sin and what sin deserves as by way of punishment. He's also trying to show his grace and his mercy. He's saying, look at how I punish sin, but look at my love. Because I love you, I have done this to my own son, to my only begotten son. I have done this. I have done the unthinkable, done what nobody can do. That's why Paul says, if he will give his own son for, he will not spare his own son, but deliver him up for us all to die. Will he not also give us all things freely? Romans 8.32. So there's the display, display of God's hatred for sin and God's love for you and I. But then finally, just look at the suffering on the cross. The suffering on the cross, first of all, a is a physical suffering. Just imagine that his body was beaten black and blue. It became like a plowed land, the Bible says, torn everywhere. The whip they whipped him with had lead, uh, sharp lead hooks that tore into his flesh tore his flesh apart. Then they nailed him, hands and legs, to the cross. And then they pierced his side, beaten him all over from head to toe. And he's hanging there. Just imagine him laying on that cross, his body rubbing, his body that's wounded, every inch of it torn, rubbing against that piece of wood, the cross, how it would have felt. Such agony and pain he felt, untold agony and pain on the cross of Calvary. But physical suffering is just a small part of it. The other suffering is emotional and psychological or mental. Why emotional, psychological? Because, for example, if when you sin, we are all God's people, but we do sometimes do some things that are wrong, right? If everybody acts like they don't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. When we do wrong, what happens? Immediately, guilt comes. You do one thing wrong, immediately you feel guilt. And as soon as guilt comes, what else comes? As soon as guilt comes, there is shame. And as soon as shame comes, there is anxiety. And after anxiety comes disappointment. And then you feel the hurt. You feel very bad. You feel discouraged. And you feel regret. See, all of the, and you feel the conviction that you've done something terrible, wrong, it's wrong against God. You're unable to sleep. You're tossing and turning. You're getting up and walking in the middle of the night because you cannot go to sleep. You are not hungry. You're not eating right. Because you've done something wrong, you feel so bad. You have a mental and emotional agony for the one thing or one or two things that you have done. One person, you have done it, and you feel so much. Just imagine the guilt of billions of people from Adam all the way to the end is taken with all its other side effects of hurt, conviction, shame, agony, and the pain and the suffering 
of going through that torture in your mind, all that was placed upon Jesus. Such heavy burden was borne by him. And plus, he's not a sinner. He's not like us. He's not an ordinary man. He has never sinned. He had no sin in him. He's pure as gold. He has never ever sinned in his life. He doesn't deserve any guilt. He doesn't deserve any punishment. Yet he had to bear all this, the sin of the whole world and the guilt and the shame and the suffering that comes with it. That's a horrible way to bear. Apart from that, thirdly, there is abandonment also. When he went into Gethsemane, all his disciples were told to pray for him. Remember, they went to sleep. While he was crying and, and sweating blood, literally, these people are sleeping. And then when they arrested him, everybody ran away. And when finally they got Peter and inquired him, he said, I don't even know who this man is. I've never heard of this man. So you can see all his friends abandoned him. His disciples, the ones that he had with him all the time, trained and preached to them, taught them and took them everywhere. They've seen the miracles. God used them wonderfully in many ways. All of them forgot and uh, abandoned him. Finally, God himself abandoned him on the cross of Calvary. That's why he cries out, my father, my, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? On the cross of Calvary, the cry of dereliction, of abandonment, he felt abandoned that God has left him. Why? Because he carried the sin of the world and God could not look upon him without looking at the sin. Therefore, God had to turn his face away. When he looked at him, he only saw sin. God turned his face away. And he had never suffered like that. Never suffered a moment of separation from God. Never suffered one moment in his life from all eternity past. He's been with God. In the beginning, he was with God. He was God. From the beginning, he was with God. Never had a moment of separation. But now on the cross, he felt it. Terrible abandonment. And finally, the wrath of God was poured upon him. The wrath of God was stored up like storing it up in a dam. All the way from Adam all the way to the cross. All the sins of all men were stored up like a dam. And all of a sudden they turned it loose and waves and waves of God's hatred and fury and animosity towards sin rolled over him so that waves and waves of God's love can roll over us. God poured out all his wrath and hatred towards sin on him so that he can turn around and pour out all his love on us. It is only after that he died, saying it's finished, and then committed his spirit to the Father. Now, why did I say all this? Because Paul says, his kindness that he has shown us in Christ Jesus is so that in the ages to come, in the ages to come, God can make his glory and grace known to everyone in the ages to come, in this age and in the coming age, now and for all eternity. God wants to use this kindness that he has shown us through the cross of Calvary to show forth his love to others. First of all, we need to understand it. We need to understand how much God loves us. We need to understand what kind of love with which God loves. It's extraordinary love with which God has loved us. That is what made us what we are. We have not made ourselves what we are. It is God's love. The psalmist said it right. It is his grace that has made him great. He was a shepherd boy, became a king. He realizes that it is his love, God's love and God's grace. And in each of our case, that's the truth, that God's love makes us what we are. And the world must know it. This age and the age to come, everybody must know it. As they see us, they must see God's love because of the kindness that God showed us in Christ Jesus. Let's clap our hands. When you sing, just sing it like a prayer, all right? Really meaning it. Yeah, I'm 